lei si, con... no. si concentra sul respiro, va bene? It happened a couple of times that I came back at home, watched the images again, and then then the feelings come out like, oh shit, then you really, then it really hurts. This is a Cinity Gear News video. Hi, I'm Johnny from Cinity, and today with me is Andrea. Andrea, how are you? I'm fine. I'm okay. Hi. Good to see you. And uh, the reason that we are actually talking, you know, from time to time, we think it's very important to talk to content creator like us who are doing something unique or special. And for me, what you did is rather unique. I would like to talk about your COVID-19 project. But before, just a little bit about your professional life, because you are actually a photographer. Yeah, so I studied actually cinema. So I started as a documentarist and I worked for 10 years in South America and Africa and a bit in Australia and China. And I did it from 2000 till 2011. And then I completely switched over to pure photography. And I only did photography projects until now when I uh, had uh, to do that documentary in the, inside the COVID-19 intensive care station in Bolzano in Italy. And we know that Italy was in, under a lot of pressure at the beginning of the crisis uh, during 2020. Where is the point that you actually tell yourself, I have to go out and I have to document what is happening as a photographer first? Yeah, I never felt like I have to do something because there was so much reporting on the media. So I felt like, yeah, what can I do? There's nothing I can tell that that's probably new. And uh, then what happened is that in um, autumn last year, there were a lot of fake news circulating on the web. There's always fake news, but uh, this time it was fake news about a friend of mine. Her name is Barbara and she works at the intensive care station here in my region. And she was uh, attacked on a social network. And so my idea was, you know what, uh, Barbara, I come and take some pictures of you and so that people can see that you're actually a real person, a real nurse, and uh, they can see what you do. That, that was the kickstart of the project. So how did you get a permit to really be in the, at the intensive care while things are happening? You know, I live in a very special place. We are a small uh, autonomous region in northern Italy, so we have our own rules and our own people working in the hospital. It's a, it's a very small hospital, so it's very familiar. So I asked for permission to take a couple of shots. The timing was perfect because they were also very upset with the fake news that were very, very personal and they were against them. So they said like, you know what, just come, we try, we see if we can work together. After the first day I sh shot inside the intensive care unit, the, the chief actually asked me, and how did it go? And I said like, I could really build up a tent here and, and shoot day and night what's happening because I really didn't expect this. And where was the point that you decided to move from taking photos only into video? You know, uh, it's 10 years I don't shoot documentaries, so I was really feeling comfortable just taking pictures. And so for the first months I did just that. And then I built up a good relationship with a doctor and he just started to talk with me and they said like, you know, I will record what you're telling me because it's interesting. Jetzt ist jetzt ein Sechstag ohne mich draußen, weil meine Frau im Moment nicht selber, man zumindest von daheim arbeiten muss, mit dem Lockdown sowieso. Ich gehe jetzt auch raus, obwohl jetzt ist die Leihoma krank und der Babysitter ist auch wieder schwierig für sie, gleichzeitig Homeoffice und die Kinder. Aber jetzt haben wir sechs Tage da gebucht, jetzt machen wir sechs Tage, zwölf Stunden jeden Tag und nachher, nachher habe ich wieder drei Tage voll wieder raus, ja, wieder drei Tage mit meinen Kindern. We made a short video, we published it in the beginning of January and that video completely went viral through Germany, Austria, Italy. It was totally unexpected. And so from that moment on, I said like, maybe I should do more of those small interviews. And, and yeah, it worked. Please try to describe, um, you know, the first moment that you're in the intensive care. I, I, I can only imagine it's like, it's like a nightmare. You know, I, I, I watched all the media, so it was already like six, seven months that we saw, you know, sick people, dying people and those images. And so I really was expecting to nothing. And the first day I went inside, it was a surprise for me. I saw so many things that were untold and I realized 
I have to make something because you always hear, yeah, today 10,000 infections, 500 deaths, whatever. After some time, they become numbers and I wanted to give them those numbers a face, a story. And that was my goal. So did you follow the intensive care unit as, as a unit or you actually uh, picked up some uh, personalities, some people to follow f through uh, the process? The first one and a half months, I just stayed in the unit and tried to figure out with whom I could talk, whom I could follow, trying to learn what's going on because I really had no idea how an intensive care unit during a pandemic works. So uh, only after one and a half months, I started to, you know, build up some relations first to nurses and doctors. I work normally with emergency in uh, in Kriegsgebieten. Und bin ja eigentlich mal zufällig in Italien gewesen und dann hat mir natürlich Bozen gefragt, ob ich ihm da auch helfen, nicht im Notfall, wie ich halt sonst in die Notfälle hilfe und dann habe ich gesagt, ja passt. And uh, through them, uh, then I, I initiated to talk to patients and understood, for example, that the last days in the intensive care unit, the last days uh, for patients are the best to interview them. You know, when they get better, that's when I made most of my interviews. In relativ fitter Sportler und vor allem ist so jede Krankheit hat sich relativ schnell verschlechtert. Ich selber, ich bin der Erste, der das ein bisschen unterschätzt hat. Okay, you know, you're in an intensive care unit and people obviously are just on the edge of either get better or unfortunately not. Who has the head to talk to you? And actually you also dressed, I, I can imagine, you, you dressed all over with no way to really talk. So how did you do this? It's very difficult. So you, you only understand it after so many months when the right time comes to talk to people. It depends from the patients and from the moment. I even interviewed, for example, one person the moment before he, they put him to sleep, you know? And it was the last time actually he talked to a person because he then died and he wanted to talk to me. Ciao, buongiorno. Ciao, come va? Buongiorno. Because the bad news of the pandemic is that, uh, of course, no friends, no family can be there to support them. So actually having a camera for them was like a possibility to again talk to parents and friends. And that was kind of nice to, to build up. Andrea, in my career, um, I've seen, actually, I've been in one or two, or actually, unfortunately, a bit more terrorist attacks, mm. filming as a, as, a, as a news cameraman. What really helped me or really protected me was the black and white viewfinder. What protected you? What helped you to, to, to go at the end of the day back home and, and be normal again? What protected me first was just knowing that I was doing the right thing, that it made sense for me to be there. They also, the, you know, everybody, nurses, doctors, and even patients made me understand that I was important. That was my big motivation. And yeah, you're right, the camera is a filter. And it happened a couple of times that I came back at home, watched the images again, and then, then the feelings come out like, oh, shit, it, it, then, you really, then it really hurts. Tell me a little bit about the engagement with the, with the staff, with the crew, because those people are obviously working around the clock sometimes. It's almost like they live in two parallel worlds. One is in the intensive care, and then they go out, and everything in a way continues normal, as normal can be, but you know, it's not the intensive care lives. Tell me a little bit how, how you felt next to them. They were really frustrated by the situation because, of course, they hear all those fake news and there's people telling them, I know, that it's just exaggerated, it's just strong flu or whatever. And even for them, it's hard to make people understand what it means to be inside the intensive care unit and having hundreds of patients coming all the time. No, ma no, 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 sei morto, eh? Non ancora, aspetta, eh? Con calma. <laughs> e perché manca manca l'ossigeno nella cavessa, sai, per quello che ci sono queste allucinazioni. Queste opinioni um, contro la realtà che viviamo noi 
mi demoralizza tanto e questo è quello più pesante per me. And that's the strange thing about the pandemic that there particularly in the western world we have two realities, the reality outside and the reality inside. And I think for us photographers and filmmakers it's the job to to build a bridge between those two realities so that they can at least try to understand a bit better each other. So, did you have a like a plan to release all that footage as 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 one major documentary or you literally collected uh, bits and pieces of of uh, videos w what is the plan or there was no plan and only now you are <laughs> planning what to do uh there was initially no plan no real plan and after two months something happened and uh, i realized i could make something unique a documentary that could work and it happened because of a nurse that was talking to people in a particular way in a very poetic way if i can say this I started to follow her. I followed her in all the steps a patient takes, like when they come in, when they wear the mask, when they get intubated, when they try to talk, when they die or when they get better. So she will be my uh, invisible red line of the story. And the documentary will have no interview. There will be no uh, words like corona, pandemic, whatever. It will just show a series of moments of what it means to be inside an intensive care unit as a patient and having nurses and doctors caring about you until the end when you die or survive. And I will probably show the documentary in autumn. It's also clear for me that I have to show it after the pandemic because I think people are not ready yet to accept those images. That's my feeling. So I will probably show the documentary in October, November, hopefully if the pandemic is over. That's what I wanted to ask because in a way, you know, it's always two stages. First is being there while things are happening. And then when you, and I guess you will do the editing, it's almost like reliving everything again. And then it yeah. can be even harder because then you go like, wow, I can't believe it, what I see. So will you be editing the video? Yes, because I have that red line in my mind. So I, I will, have, of course, do the raw editing. But I don't know where I, when I can start because I just stopped 10 days ago to, to uh, record everything. And I still haven't found the moment where I take my laptop and watch the images. It's, uh, I, I need some time, you know, to uh, blend off the, all what I saw uh, and I don't know how long it will take, but I will do the editing. I know the story, I know how it will end. So uh, the film is there in my head, so. Okay, let's move and talk a little bit about equipment. I know intensive care units quite well. One of the most dominant things over there, besides the images, is actually the sound. Wow. The sound can be so significant. How did you deal with the sound? It's only on camera sound or you made sure that you have the, what, what you really want after some time, after getting to know the, the unit itself? Actually, the, the hardest job I ever did, uh, because there's not only a sound problem, there's also a space problem. There's also a privacy problem, and what probably sounds strange for technical people is that now I shoot all the entire documentary with one lens, and it's a manual focusing lens, which, which is the Foyt lens of 40mm 1.2. Because for the sound, I had to be really extremely close, because otherwise you don't hear anything, because there, yeah, there are the machines doing noise, the alarms going off, and of course you have the mask uh, and, the, and the face shield in front of the doctors and uh, nurses, so I needed a wide angle. And at the same time, they were not static, they were constantly moving. So I always feared, you know, when they were moving to record something that, you, ah, you know, you cannot show. And what I really wanted from the start is not blurring out people, you know, like you see in the news, uh, where you see them blurred, because that creates just a distance in the story. And I didn't want that. So uh, with the 40mm 1.2, I was able to keep the background blurry enough to be able to follow the people wherever they, they, they go. And uh, also the manual focus didn't bother me because, you know, the, there were a lot of reflection on the face shield and uh, out of focus really did, kept doing a mess anyway. And with the manual focus, it's, it's much easier for me. And with the picking, you are always more or less spot on. And so that's how I work. And for the sound, I have the microphone for the Sony A7R4. I don't remember the name, but it's the microphone that only works for that camera. And it really did a superb job. So, so obviously, you relied on the on, on the camera uh, IBIS in order to stabilize the images if you're working with a, a, a lens which is 40 millimeter 
uh, in length and um, um, handheld, I guess, most of the time? Yeah, it's always handheld, yeah. So you relied on the sensor image stabilizer of the camera? Yeah, 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 of course. But it, yeah, it's a bit shaky. The film will be a shake, bit shaky because uh, I really keep moving a lot of time because there's no moment where they're really uh, in one place doing something slowly. It is, no, it's impossible. So um, I wish the IBIS would work just a tiny bit better, but it's okay. Technically speaking, would you do anything different? Uh, do you regret on working on certain settings? Yeah, I would have loved to have the Sony uh, A1 to record everything in 8K. <laughs> that would have been nice for me. No, what I regret is that um, I did record everything in uh, 1080p because yeah. at that time I was constantly uh, giving away my camera to a friend that needed it and he had to record it. In, uh, he had to record something 1080p, so I said like ah, I would keep just I would just keep the setting because I there was no plan to do actually make a documentary. It was and when uh, I made those interviews, it was only for YouTube. So who who does care for? I don't need 4K. Now after six months, I say ah, I should have done everything 4K from from the start. Okay, Andrea, thank you very much for sharing with us your story, and I really hope to talk again soon. Yeah, I hope to. And guys. Thank you very much for watching and please don't forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel. Thank you.